Fellowship of the Nation, can I have your attention, please? Everyone, please be seated in the presence of Jesus Christ. May I have your attention, please? I'm going to make this really quickly. First, I want to say welcome in the name of Jesus. We're so humbled that you're here. And I just want to tell you something that was on my heart for quite a while. Normally, when we pray, what do we normally do? We ask, we thank God for his goodness, and then we go petition, petition after petition, me, 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 me. And what's been put on my heart lately, have you ever asked God what's on his heart? Or maybe what breaks his heart? Because let me tell you, a while ago, abortion was made legal in, in New York, and that tore me to pieces. And I know for a fact that it tore God's heart into millions of pieces. So next time, whenever you're in your quiet time and you're praying, whatever it may be, ask God what breaks his heart. Just like the song that says, Lord, break our heart for what breaks yours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us, Lord. We are humbled by your presence, Father God. And Lord, I just want to tell you how awesome it is to be up here to speak and praise your, your beautiful name, Lord. We kiss your, your wonderful face, Father God, with our praise and our worship, Lord. And I ask that next time we're in prayer, Lord, that you tell us what's breaking your heart so that we may come together as one body, fall on our knees in your presence and pray for this evil to go away. For if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then you say, Lord, then I will hear from heaven and I will restore your land and forgive your sin. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Let's stand up and sing together.
But the Word of God says that if we don't praise Him, that the rocks are going to cry out. And I don't want a rock crying out in my place. I don't know what I would do without the love of God in my life. His Word says that the steadfast Lord, love of the Lord is forever. Oh, the love of Father gave. Only love can make a way. All oh, from love of heaven's cry. Love was crucified. Oh, how many times have I broken your heart? But still, you forgive. If only I.
out in here? of victory. We're, in, we're entering a season of winning. And victory for the kingdom of God. Amen. And I know some of you feel under attack. Some of you, you feel oppressed by the enemy. You feel bombarded. You feel under siege. But I'm here to tell you this morning that you have the victory already. The victory was purchased for you on the cross. And we're going to walk in the victory, amen? And we're going to lift up the name that's above all names. Who knows his name this morning? Somebody say his name this morning. When we say we lift your name up, we're talking about the name of Jesus. Because there's no other name by which we can be saved. So let's take the next couple of minutes and we're just going to lift up the name of Jesus. Is that okay with you? Because I didn't come here to do anything else but lift up the name of Jesus. That's why I woke up this morning, to lift up the name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. lifting up the name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, there's no other name. Jesus, by which I can be saved. Jesus, oh, I love the name of Jesus. Say it again, say Jesus, power in the name of Jesus, mercy in the name of Jesus, freedom in the name of Jesus, healing in the name of Jesus, he's breaking every chain, Jesus, oh I love the name of Jesus, oh I need the name of Jesus, oh I speak the name of Jesus. Worship in your name, oh Jesus. Glorify the name of Jesus. Worship in the name of Jesus. Oh, I love the name of Jesus. There's just something about the name of Jesus. Something about the 
vocabulary because we're going to speak it to mountains and they're going to move you understand we're going to speak the name of jesus to diseases and they're going to be healed yes we're going to speak the name of jesus to spiritual slaves and they're going to be freed in the name of jesus in the name of jesus don't neglect the power that's been given to you as the body of Christ, to speak the name of Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. Yeah. your name. The precious blood of the Lamb. The enemy has been defeated. Something Here we go. The, the enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you down. Gonna lift our voice in victory. We're gonna make your praises loud. The enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you ready to walk in victory this morning. Let's raise this up one more time. Your praises loud. Cause the enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you could down. Hold you down. It's our voice in victory. We're gonna make your praises loud. In the, the enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you down. down. Gonna lift our voice in victory. We're gonna make your of triumph. Shout unto God. Lift your hands in the air. You're a champion. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Hey! Shout unto God with the voice of praise. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. Shout unto God with the voice of
thinking just now? I was thinking about when David met up with Goliath, and he was a little guy, you know, and they tried to put Saul's armor on him because he was the only one that had enough courage to go out against the giant. Out of all of the angel armies, all of God's armies, he was the only one that said, I'll go, I'll, I'll kill him. And he was just a shepherd boy. He wasn't even a soldier yet. And they tried to put Saul's armor on him, and it was heavy and too big for him, and he said, I, I can't wear this. I just need my slingshot. And I'm going to get five, sp five smooth stones he, he brought with him. And the first stone that he slung hit the giant right between the eyes and killed him. Okay? And you would have thought that would have been enough. But you know what he did? He reached down and he got Goliath's sword. I don't know how much it weighed, but I think it was like ridiculous because he was nine feet tall. And he picked up the sword and he cut the he cut the enemy's head off just to make sure. <laughs> Unless you're a chicken, you're not gonna get back up, right? And I don't know about you, but now we have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. We don't even need a slingshot anymore. We just need the name of Jesus out of a heart that's pure and in love with him. And the enemy's got to go. We're going to raise up the standard of the cross of Jesus Christ against our enemy, and they have to flee. And you say, well, I got a, I got a flesh and blood enemy right now in my life. But let me tell you, the Bible says that we don't wrestle with real flesh and blood. We wrestle with spirits, darkness, darkness principalities and high places and it's our privilege and our right as children of God to wield the weapon that God has given us and that is the word of God our testimony and the blood of Jesus that's what defeats our enemies amen it's time for the people of God to stop cowering and stop being afraid and stop running in fear because I don't know how to pray right. Do you know how to say the name of Jesus? That's all you got to do. And let the Spirit of God say the rest. Amen? I don't know whether, who that's for today, but I needed it, so amen? Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you. You got here before we came here this morning. You've been preparing a place for us all week long and your presence is here we don't even have to get loud for your presence to come down but we do have to come with a heart that's pure and been washed with the water of your word and so God today we ask that you would cleanse us whatever stuff we brought in with us Lord we lay it down right now just lay it down shake it off people the anger and the uncertainty, the fear, the jealousy, all those things that are huge roadblocks between you and him, just reject them right now. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would just fill this place with so much of yourself that we're just invisible. And all we can see and hear and understand is you and how good you are. Spell every lie that's been told to us. Everything we believed about ourselves that is contrary to what you believe, God, we reject that in Jesus' name. I'm not a loser. I'm not a failure. I'm just not a, a mess up. I'm not an embarrassment. I'm not a disappointment. up the standard against my enemy and I am your warrior and I know who I am in Christ thank you Lord for your goodness today thank you for coming and worshiping let, let us worship you Lord let, thank you so much Lord for being here we recognize your presence we hallow your name this morning speak to our hearts now through your word in Jesus name
Come on, church. I think we can get louder than that for a risen king. Amen? Amen. If you can't already tell, we are all about Jesus, and we are so grateful that you joined us this morning. And so as we prepare our hearts for giving and our tithes and offerings, we want to remind you that we believe that God is the God of his word. Amen? And we believe that God's going to do what he said he will do. Amen? And so part of that is that when we walk in obedience, when we give God our absolute best, that he will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that we cannot contain. And everybody said, amen. And so we just want to encourage you to walk in obedience, tithe your 10%, um, trust God this morning, especially if you've never even done that before, and watch him exceed all of your needs and all of your desires. So if you're giving... You can give on fotan.org through our text mobile giving or through the envelope that's sitting in front of you. And so however you're giving, let's have faith-filled hearts and offer this to our deserving holy king. Amen. God, we thank you so much that we have the honor of speaking the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you, Father, that you're not a distant God, but you are intimately acquainted with the details of our life, Father. And so I thank you, Lord, that you don't always give us what we want, but you do give us what we need, Lord. And so I just pray for these who are stepping out of faith to trust you wholeheartedly in this area of giving. God, I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't feel obligated to give, but we would feel compelled. We would feel honored to give back to you this morning, God, recognizing that we don't deserve anything, but you give and give to us anyways, Lord. And so we don't just want to be a receiver. We also want to give back unto you as a form of worship for how amazing you are in recognition of how undeserving we are, Lord. And so we pray for these seeds. I thank you, Lord, that they're literally changing lives. They're changing this community and the nations around our world. And so we call every family member doing so blessed. And we thank you for what you're going to do ahead of time. And it's in Jesus' matchless name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you for joining us here today at Fellowship of the Nations. Here's what's coming up. As we finish up our Daniel fast, we want to hear from you about what God has spoken to your heart about and how he has moved in your family, your marriage, your finances, your job, and your personal mission field. So drop Pastor Johnny an email at pastorjohnny at FOTN.org. For more information, go to the FOTN.org website for links, recipes, and scriptures. Care groups are small groups of people who meet with a common interest to study the Bible, pray together, fellowship, and build lasting relationships. So are you connected to a care group yet? Well, what are you waiting for? See Pastor Locke or check the Welcome Center for more information on the groups that are available. New care groups are launching in February, so see Pastor Locke to get more information or check at the Welcome Center. Now everybody, go out and have a great week. That's with Johnny Brady, everybody. <laughs> that is a shofar, is what that is. Anyway, they, when, they, when they got ready to go into battle, they would blow the shofar, and it's a way of, uh, when, they, when the enemy would, would come out, what they would do is they would go out and they'd send the worshipers out before the army. And, uh, and so once they blew the shofars, man, the Spirit of God began to move. So that's what that was about. So I'm just saying. Anyway, we want to uh, welcome you. If you're here for the first time at Fellowship of the Nations, man, we greet you in the name of Jesus. And we're so glad that you're here. You're kind of wondering, man, these people, they shout and they raise hands and they sing loud and whatever. The reason, the reason is we were lost. We needed a Savior. Our lives were a mess, and God came after us, and by his grace, he has saved us, amen, and he has transformed our lives, amen. 
So that's why we get excited about Jesus. We're just a Jesus church. We're not a denomination, but we're a multi-denominational fellowship. And if you have a label on you, if you're a Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, whatever, it's okay with us, but we're just going to te teach you about Jesus, okay? Because that's the only way we're going to get to heaven, amen? All right, there's not departments in heaven where the Catholics are here and the Baptists are here and the Methodists are over here. No, the redeemed by the blood of the Lamb is, is, is the only department there is, amen? Well, listen, we're really excited. Before we get uh, any, any further into the service, uh, one of our ministries, we have, uh, we're Fellowship of the Nations, so we have a lot of different nations. We have Freedom Nation, it's a ministry uh, to our prisons and juvenile detention centers, but we also have Fighter Nation. Then you're saying, what kind of church is that? We want to reach people no matter where they are. And over the last seven and a half years of this ministry, uh, it's a boxing ministry. There's been over 170 salvations that have come through. So we're excited. So, but it is, uh, they have golden gloves. And we have three of our boxers who are fighting today for the championship round. And so I want Pastor Termite of Fighter Nation. Come introduce those guys real quick and we're going to pray over them. All right, we, uh, before I introduce these guys, we want to give a big shout out to Jacob. He's already won the Golden Gloves from Fighter Nation. And he did it with flying colors. Okay, uh, Christian, come right on up here. Gio. No, where's Diego? I'm looking. Oh, Diego, there he is right there. I, was, I didn't see him. So we got Diego, we got Gio, and we got Christian. And we got. Amen. So we are proud of these guys. Listen, we, we're just going to pray. They'll knock them out in the name of Jesus and then pray healing over them when they get up. <laughs> Amen. Let, 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 me, let me say this. It's more than boxing. It's more than boxing. What we pray for is that God would raise them up in a platform as a champion that they would be able to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. All right? It's not to glorify them. It's all to glorify Jesus. Amen? Amen. Reach out your hands to them. Let's pray over them. Father, we pray for these. Lord, they have trained. They have been faithful to work hard. Lord, they do this as unto you, so that you would get all the glory. But Father, we pray you protect them. Father, let them be excellent today in all that they do. And Father, we're praying, Lord, that you would just bless them indeed, God, that we would see victory for your glory. And Father, we pray that they would give you all the glory. And even through this, they would see you, Jesus, living through them in the way they act, conduct themselves in every manner. And Father, we thank you for that. And we give you all the praise and glory. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you guys. Amen. Go get them. Go get them. All right, Diego. Strong in the Lord, brother. Be strong in the Lord. All right. Anybody? Okay. They got to go right now, so they're going to exit out stage left so as they are leaving. All right. They're going to beat the devil out of them. That's what they said. All right. Anybody, anybody got the word? Word up, hold it in the air like you really, really care. <laughs> Say it together. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. It is a lamp to my feet, a light into my path. I will hide His Word in my heart so that I might not sin against God. Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear and strength to obey. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Well, today we have the, the joy of hearing our executive pastor. This is Pastor Locke, and so he is going to be bringing us the word. And we're, woo! And we, and we are, uh, we're finishing up on our series of, uh, of bold, and so uh, amen. So let's give it up for Pastor Locke. Amen. All right. Are you glad you came to church today? I am, I'm glad you're here. Because it'd be weird if nobody was here. Um, yeah, so we're we're concluding the series today about bold. We're talking about bold obedience. Amen. Uh, but first, I want to tell you about um, a little story about my son, um, Ledger. He's nine, and he somewhere over the holidays he got obsessed with this game called Would You Rather. You never played that. Like, would you rather only eat hot dogs for the rest of your life or only eat pancakes, you know, you, and you have to pick one? You know? Would you rather have no legs or no arms? You know? And some of them were cerebral, you know. So he started coming up with these weird would you rathers, and I was in bed one evening, and Kayla came in, and she goes, Ledger just asked me the weirdest would you rather I've ever heard. I was like, 
go on. And she said, he goes, okay, would you rather be all alone on the planet, no other people? And I'm like, I don't need to hear any more. That's all I want, you know. <laughs> I don't even need the other one. And no family, no friends, no one else. Or the same thing, but there's snakes everywhere. And she goes, uh, the first one, he goes, you want to be all alone? <laughs> She's like, instead of all alone with snakes? Yes. He goes, but they're nice snakes. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Can't win. Um, so, anyway, bold obedience. Uh, obedience is a very uncomfortable subject to our flesh. We don't want to obey. And if uh, you parents out there, you know that your kids sometimes don't want to obey, to put it lightly. You know. And sometimes, and they, or they want a reason why. Why do I have to do that? You remember having those arguments with your parents? But why? Why do I have to do it? And what, what would they say? Because I said so. Just to... And as a kid, you're like, well, that's not fair. But as an adult, you're like, what I'm saying is I don't have time to explain Every instruction I give you, you need to just trust that I know better than you because I'm smarter than you, <laughs> believe it or not, and just do it, just do it, just obey, just do it. <laughs> so that's what because I said so means, and you don't really realize that until you become a parent and you, start, you hear yourself starting to say the same things that your parents used to say, things that you never thought you'd say, and Things you hated when they said them, and you're like, well, I'm saying these exact same things. Oh, that's why. Or maybe you realize my parents didn't really know what they were doing either, and <laughs> they're just kind of making it up as they go. So um, there's a great story I read about these two, two moms were at, at the uh, grocery store shopping, and they were talking about being a mom, and and one said to the other, isn't it sad that we had real moms and that our kids only have us? <laughs> and the other lady goes, I knew exactly what she meant. Because you're like, I had real parents and I'm just, I'm just making it up. I don't know what I'm doing. It's like, well, no one really knows. It's not really. You love the kid and you train the kid. You know, that's a, take it one day at a time. <laughs> But obedience is a very uncomfortable subject to our flesh. We don't want to obey. It's in our nature to rebel and to seek after our own interests and not bend to the will of someone else. I mean, that, if you get a strong-willed kid, was anyone else a strong-willed kid? And they just were not going to give in. And they just they were going to learn everything the hard way. Maybe you were like that. Maybe certainly you have someone in your family like that. I gotta learn everything the hard way. I'm gonna figure this out for myself. I, know. I remember my dad told me when I was very young, he goes, learn from my mistakes. <laughs> you don't need to go make your own mistakes. Learn from my mistakes. Um, so, we're talking about obedience today. Uh, and we've been talking about this story. Pastor's been telling the story every week um, from, from Acts uh, chapter five about uh, Peter and John. And this, this is uh, the time when the, the Holy Spirit had come, and they had the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people were saved. And then, uh, then the, the lame man was healed. You remember that story? They're walking into the temple, and there's a man there asking for alms. And they said, we don't have alms, and so they, and so they gave him legs. You can take that one home with you and chew on it later. Uh, so he was healed, and then 5,000 people got saved. Can, I can't even fathom 5,000. So 8,000 people in a very short amount of time. Uh, miracles were happening, and demons were being cast out, and the Sadducees uh, were jealous. I love that he ascribes a, a motive and an emotion to these Sadducees. 
they were jealous, and they were feeling pressure from the Romans to handle the situation. So, so Acts uh, 5, 17 says, The high priest and his officials, who were Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them for, you know, for teaching about Jesus and put them in the public jail. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, and brought them out. Then he told them, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. All right, so we're going to kind of break this story down. Um, uh, number one, bold obedience usually triggers opposition. If you're doing the will of God, you're going to run into some opposition. And that's just how it is. If you don't have any opposition, you need to check to see if you're doing the will of God. Okay? Because verse 18 says, they arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. I think that counts as opposition. Right? So, and this is the second time they've been put in jail in a very short amount of time. So if they obey, just so we're clear, if they obey and do the thing God is instructing them to do, they are essentially breaking the law and they're going to be arrested. Now what, how, what worries your faith in that scenario? Do you have faith enough to obey anyway, even if it, you risk being arrested, put in jail? Thank God we live in a country where we're free to worship and free to speak the name of Jesus. And that freedom was bought for us at a high price and we need to appreciate it. But it's not like that everywhere. And there's some still parts of the world where you will be put in jail. And everything will be taken away from you if you speak the name of Jesus and preach the name of Jesus. And if you obey boldly, you're going to face opposition. If you're not ready, this is where you need to question your heart. If you're not ready to face opposition because of your obedience, you're not ready to be used by God. Just accept the fact that you're going to face opposition. It's going to get awkward. It's going, there's going to be conflict. But you need to obey anyway. In the face of the opposition. All right? Bold obedience often releases God's miracles. Because obedience is an act of faith, isn't it? And faith moves God to act on your behalf. I want to say that again. Obedience is an act of faith. And faith moves God to act on your behalf. So verse 19 says, But an angel of the Lord came at night and opened the gates of the jail and brought them out. Notice how simply Luke describes this, this uh, occurrence, this miracle. Because when you're walking in the spirit and in the center of God's will, miracles become a common occurrence. Uh, who's been walking with God for a while and you realize that You've kind of gotten used to how he operates. And, you, and, and things don't seem like coincidences anymore. Because you realize, oh, God was, has been setting this up for a while, and I got to step into my position and play my part. And because of my obedience, I got to see God move in an amazing way. And who can say, you can raise your hands if you want. Who can say that there's been a moment in your life where there was no other way out but God God intervened on your behalf. He's a God of miracles. And he still is. So they're in, these guys are in jail for preaching the gospel, and an angel just opened the door, and they walked out. I'm trying to get my mind around, like, what would I do? How would I feel? So we're getting more into that later. So, and bold obedience always requires faith, just, just to be clear. If you're obeying God, it's going to require faith from you. Why? Because we don't know everything that's going to happen. And it's not our job to know everything that's going to happen. It's just our job to obey. Okay? So verse 20 says, the, the angel said, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. So at daybreak, the, the apostles entered the temple as they were told, and immediately... Began, this is the thing they were just arrested for and put in jail. Immediately began teaching. When the high priest and his officials arrived, they convened the high council, the full assembly of the elders of Israel. This was a big deal. This was a, an emergency. <laughs> they were in crisis because these guys, everybody's getting saved and everybody's talking about Jesus. 
and they're blaming us for his crucifixion, and we're in trouble. And we can, we can keep arresting these guys all we want, but we got to figure out something. So they're having a little meeting with all the, uh, the elders, right? Then they sent for the apostles to be brought from the jail for trial. Problem there. They're not in jail anymore. They're gone. But when the temple guards went to the jail, the men were gone. So they returned to the council and reported the jail was securely locked with the guards standing outside. But when we opened the gates, no one was there. I love that the guards were still standing outside. I'm picturing like a real Cheech and Chong moment. <laughs> of these just guards standing there, and they're like, who are you guarding? You're guarding these guys, man. <laughs> There's nobody in there. Whoa, man. He said far out. Blew my mind, yeah. <laughs> Don't watch those movies. What's wrong with them? <laughs> when the, this is a real moment here. When the captain of the temple guard and the leading priest heard this, they were perplexed. Whoa. <laughs> Wondering where it would all end. Where is it going to end? That's more like Keanu Reeves a little bit. Whoa. How's it going to end? Then someone arrived with startling news. <laughs> the men you put in jail are standing in the temple teaching the people. <laughs> the captain went with his temple guards and arrested the apostles again. <laughs> but without violence, for they were afraid the people would stone them. Going to get stoned, man. And then... Then they brought the apostles before the high council where the high priest confronted them. You have been, I, they're confronting them because the, you have perplexed us. <laughs> how'd you, and, nobody's, and they don't say, how'd you get out of jail? That's, that's the, my first question. How'd you get out of the jail? Where'd you go? We had guards. So if I'm in jail, this is just, this is me talking. If I'm in jail and an angel breaks me out, my first thought would be leaving town and never coming back. <laughs> You'd never see me again. I just disappear. I'd be on a beach with Andy Dufresne sanding a boat. <laughs> You'd never see me again. Are you catching all these references? I'm just, I'm really firing. They've already been put in jail twice for the same thing. And God told them to return to the scene of the crime and do it again. And they did it. They go, okay. And so they went there and said, immediately started teaching again. You can't shut them up. Mm. When God prompts you to do something, it will require faith. They had to know they were going to get in trouble again. They're going to get, you broke out of jail? Ah, it's fine, whatever. It's fine. We'll let, we'll, this time we'll let you off. They had to know that they were going to face opposition again. They went back to the same place and just did it again. Because God said to, just do it again. It's going to require faith if you want to obey God. Know that God knows the details. And he doesn't have to let you in on any of them. But just trust that he knows. If you're analytical like me, you want some specifics. Right? I want details. This is just how, my mind. All right? I want to know, what am I walking into, and what's my exit strategy? I don't want to walk into a place and not know how to get out of whatever situation I'm about to get into, because it's going to get sticky, and it's going to get weird, and God's just saying, just go. Just obey. Okay. So God's saying to you and me <laughs> this morning, don't worry about all the details. Just obey, and I will handle the rest. And when you hear that, this is where we really need to, this is something we need to take home today. When you hear that, does that scare you, or does that comfort you? Because that's where the faith comes in. I was talking to my son about bravery. I said, you know, bravery is not the absence of fear. Bravery is when you're scared to death, and then you do it anyway. 
Some things that God's going to ask you to do are going to be scary. He's going to ask you to go talk to your neighbor. He's going to ask you to talk to that mean coworker. He's going to ask you to talk to that family member that no one thinks will ever get saved. And it's going to be, oh, what if they reject me? What if, they, what if they yell at me? What if I get in trouble for saying this? Do it anyway, because he's telling you to do it, right? We're going to get real practical before this is over, I promise. So do you want to start bold obedience? It starts with obeying God's word, because the Bible is described as a lamp unto our feet. You ever held a lamp to your feet and it's pitch black outside? You can't see very far. You can see one or two steps in front of you, but you can see the next step. If you can see the next step, you can take it. That's what the Bible is for. That's what his word's for. Taking that next step. He's not going to show you the whole thing because you probably wouldn't do it. If you knew half the stuff that God got you into, when you first started walking with God, you'd say, oh, no thanks. That's too scary. That's too much. But if, if he shows you the next step, I can do that. I can take that step. I have enough faith for that step. I don't know what's down the road, but I'm just trusting him one step at a time. Can I get, can we go a little deeper? This is what tithing is. Tithing, from the world's point of view, from financial point of view, from logic point of view, from mathematic point of view, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It just works. Who can say that tithing has benefited their life and their finances? You see, if you're having a problem trusting God with your tithing, find somebody with their hand up and say, what's, what's the deal with tithing? What's the big deal? What, why, why do I need to do it? Because it, it, it will change your life. Because it's a picture. It's a picture of your heart. It's a picture of God's ownership of your life. If you hang on to that 10%, mm, that means God doesn't have ownership. See, I want God sitting firmly on the throne of my heart. And an outward picture of that is putting that tithe down and trusting him with it. This doesn't make any sense, but I'm, I'm just going to do it. Because, and I'm going to stand on your promises of, and the blessings of what happens when I obey. Amen? You are going to get blessed today, I promise. Before you leave. You, if you leave without getting blessed, that's not my fault. That's on you. <laughs> Let's talk about disobedience for just a minute. And this, this goes back to when I was a kid, too. My, my parents used to say, if it's not immediate obedience, it is disobedience. And God's saying that to you today, too. If it's not immediate obedience, it is disobedience. There is a window of obedience. If you miss the window, you are in disobedience. Does that make sense? Okay. This delayed obedience is not obedience. Partial obedience is not obedience. Tipping God, 2%, 5%, you're in disobedience. Got real quiet. Partial obedience is disobedience. Obey completely and immediately, no matter what. Why? Because there's blessing. There's blessing in it. Because that, that sounds scary, doesn't it? To obey completely and immediately, no matter what. It sounds scary. So let's get practical. Is it better for you to deal with the unknown outcomes of your obedience to God or suffer the very real consequences of your disobedience? Because there are consequences. I want to be under his protection. I want to live in the abundance of his provision. And I want to operate under the influence of his anointing. And none of these things can happen if I'm in disobedience. 
If I'm not right with God, I'm not obeying his word, I don't get the benefit of all these things. I want to be in the center of his will. This is like Christianity 101 stuff, I understand. But a lot of us still don't get it. I know people who've been walking with God 20, 30 years, they still don't get this. They think coming to church once a month, giving God a tip, and they think they're walking in obedience. You're not. All right? Y'all still like me? Okay. So if it's, if it's something big, obey. If it's something small, obey. Does that make sense? If you're faithful in those little things, God's going to bless you with much. And it starts with obedience. It starts with trusting him enough and understanding that he has plans for you. And they're plans for your good. And they're plans for your blessing. Also, he's smarter than you. He knows more than you. Just like you know more than your kids, despite what they think. And trusting him and obeying him is an act of faith. You're, I'm just saying, God, I trust you. I trust that you know more than me. I trust that you're smarter than me. Aren't you glad God's smarter than you? Aren't you dumb sometimes? I know I am. All right, so verse 28, they don't ask the obvious question, which is, how'd you get out of jail? <laughs> the guy says, we gave you strict orders never to teach in this man's name again. He won't even say the name. We gave you strict orders. I've said this to my kids, too. I gave you very simple, strict instructions. You have to go upstairs and take a bath. And, and according to my nose, you didn't do it. What did you not get between the time I said it and the time you didn't? We gave you strict instructions, strict orders, never again to teach in this man's name, he said. Instead, you have filled, come on somebody, all Jerusalem with your teaching about him. And you want to make us responsible for his death. Peter wasn't pulling any punches when it came to that crucifixion thing. That was a recent event. And everybody knew about it. He said, you did it. They said, in whose name did you heal this man? In the name of Jesus Christ, who you crucified. Remember him? That's in whose name we did this miracle. If that didn't, if they didn't pucker up when they heard that, I don't know. <laughs> but Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. We must obey God rather than man. We must obey God rather than man. So will we, Fellowship of the Nations, will we become a must-obey servants of God? I must obey. Why did you do that thing? How, you know, God just blessed this thing that you did, and why, why did you, what compelled you to do that? I must obey God. I must obey. And your flesh mm, doesn't like that. That's like sandpaper on your flesh. And that's okay. Your flesh isn't out to do you any good. Your flesh is there to make you feel good for a little while. But it's not about your blessing. Flesh wants that, that temporary thing. God's looking for eternal things for your life. He wants to put you in the path of his will so that you can be blessed with eternal things. I love you guys so much. We're almost done. So let's be bold as a church and make a difference in our community. It's got to start with our obedience. It's got to start with recognizing that he is Lord. I am not. And God, I'm trusting you with your will and your purpose for my life. Easier said than done. Because you get the big decisions, and man, you want to, the flesh wants to do it in, in your own strength and figure it out with your own wisdom and do whatever you reason in your mind is the best thing. And God's saying, just obey. Listen to my voice and obey. So Jesus gave us a parable about true obedience in Matthew. Jesus says, but what do you think about this? Matthew 21, 28. 
A man with two sons told the older boy, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, No, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. It's a very typical oldest son. Then the father told the other son, You go. And he said, Yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which of the two obeyed his father? They replied, the first one. Then Jesus explained his meaning. He says, I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. This is the religious people he's talking to. They're gonna, these sinners, these outcasts, these people you don't want to, these pariahs that you don't want to associate with, they're going to get into the kingdom of God before you. Why? For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him, while tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe and repent of your sins. You know what Jesus is saying to us today? It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you look like, where you live, what kind of car you drive. God's not concerned about any of that. You know why? Because none of that stuff's going to get you into heaven. None of that stuff's going to save you from your sins. Faith and obedience to God. Faith and obedience to God. If you do that, it doesn't matter where you're from. If you repent, God has forgiveness for you. It's available to you. And Jesus gave us, of course, the ultimate example of obedience. Philippians 2.5 says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that's true obedience. And he grappled with that, and he sweat drops of blood over that. But in the end, he said, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, God, but thine be done. Why? That's an example to us. If Jesus can obey and go to the cross, we can obey and go across the street and talk to our neighbors. We can obey and reach out to our lost loved ones. It's got to start with obedience. Why? Because obedience is about your heart. It's not just about the action. It's an outward picture that you have enough faith in God to know that He's got your back. He's walking with you every step of the way. And even when you're obeying and you're walking through a scary place, figuratively or literally, even when he calls you to another country, that he's walking with you every step of the way. So Jesus, bold obedience, as expressed through Jesus, came in the form of humbling himself to the will of God. Can you humble yourself to God's will and recognize that he's Lord of your life? You gotta make him Lord of your life. Lord of your life means he's in the driver's seat, not you. Again, this is, this is basic principles, but we still need to get it if it's gonna take place in our life, if, if, the, if the effect of it's going to happen in our life. We still need to understand and put it into practice. So obedience is about your heart. God's desire is to use you to fulfill his will. And in the process, he's teaching you character and conforming you to the image of Jesus and setting you up for blessing and position in his kingdom. Only blessed and eternal things can come from your obedience. So what is holding you back? What's the anchor of rebellion that is keeping you from surrendering 
to his will for your life. He is calling us out of the darkness of isolation and meaningless striving and into the light, into the light of his purpose and transformative power. He wants a relationship with you. Did you know that? He wants a relationship with you. And this is, and I've been saved for 26 years now. And this still blows my mind. He wants a relationship with me. Who am I? He's the God of the universe. And he wants a relationship with you today. Do you know how much he loves you? Do you know what he wants for your life? Do you know he has plans for your future, for a hope, for your blessing? Let's trust him enough to obey and recognize that he's good and that he's a loving father. It's got to start with your obedience. Uh, I believe it was the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, if your son asks you for a fish, you can give him a snake. If he asks you for an egg, you can give him a scorpion. Or bread, you can give him a rock. No. They said, if you, who are wicked, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? How much more? Does your heavenly father know how to give good gifts to you? He loves you. He loves you. So when he tells me to obey, I got to recognize he's not going to, he's not telling me to do something that's going to harm me. He's doing something for my eternal blessing. And he's calling me out of my isolation, calling me out of my striving, calling me to stop putting my faith and trust in my flesh and put it in him. He's a good God. And if you're here today, I'm here to tell you that he loves you very much. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that your love for us is more than we could ever measure. And it's available to us today through the blood of your son, Jesus. I, I pray for the blessing and protection of your spirit on every person here, God, every family and home represented, that we would be a people of bold obedience, people who take you at your word, people who have faith in who you are and faith that your plans for us are good. God, we want to trust you with everything. We want to lean on you and not on our own understanding. We want to acknowledge that you are the Lord of our life. Oh, fill us with your spirit today. Teach us to obey. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to thank you so much for being a part of our online streaming. I hope you really enjoyed the message today. And I want you to just take it to heart. Whatever the Lord has spoken to you, just take it to heart. And, and I pray that if you have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that today would be that day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. So that's what we're praying for you. And if you're wondering, how do I get to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Well, let me tell you, it's pretty simple. First of all, Jesus loves you more than anybody on this planet. So let me tell you, He's wanting you to know Him. So as you come to Him, we recognize, one, that we've sinned against God. Everybody has. The Bible says that all have sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. Well, we recognize that one. We don't have to be told that. We know that. The second thing is, it says that God demonstrated His love for us, and that's you. God loves you even though that we were sinners. That's how much He cares for you. So you got to get it out of the way. He's not judging you. He already sent his son to die in our place so that we could have all of our sin placed upon him. And then we believe we had faith in him that that's what he did. And he did it because he loved us. 
The Bible says the wages of our sin is death. Well, Jesus took our death sentence for us. But then it doesn't leave it as a negative. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. It's not works. It's not a, a church membership somewhere. It's not giving money to somebody. All of those are good things, but this not, does not bring salvation. So now, how do you get there? It's only in Jesus. So simply just open your heart and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me. I want to turn away from all the stupid stuff that I'm doing. And I want to turn to you. I want you to be my Lord, my Savior, the boss of my life. And Jesus, come in and save me. I want to love you. I want to live for you. I want to obey your word all the days of my life. And that's what you can do. Pray that prayer right now. And I'll tell you, Jesus is waiting. And the moment, the instant you do that, you will be saved. And my encouragement to you, find a great Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. Get connected. Now, if you're in the Houston area, man, we would love to have you at Fellowship of the Nations. But if you're in different parts of the country or even around the world, find somewhere that they're preaching Jesus. And I promise you, it will change your life. Hope you can join us again next week. And uh, up until then, we'll be praying for you. Pray for us. We'd love to hear from you. Just go on our website, fotn.org, Fellowship of the Nations, and let us hear from you. God bless you.